Well, it's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to be here at Calvary Chapel Romoland. And um, Pastor Jerry gave me the opportunity again to be able to join you all and to, to speak. So, um, first of all, I just want to um, say, and what a pleasure it is. You know, as I see a lot of familiar faces here, I've been coming up to the ranch uh, lately a, a few times uh, this la- these past months. So, I've been able to see Lupe. And uh, the rest of the guys that are there. And um, I see a lot of familiar faces. Kathy tells me about a lot of the work that's going on over at the, uh, the ladies' ranch also. And she has the opportunity to come over here and speak also. And so, again, welcome everybody. And um, it's always a pleasure when Pastor Jerry gives me the, the opportunity to speak to you all. Now, today, um, what, uh, my message is entitled, How the Church Grows. And I feel that this is a very important message. And the reason why is because as we look around us today, especially this time, it's 2021. Who knew what was going to take place in 2020, right? It seems as though the church is being targeted and being silenced. And I don't want to seem like one of those uh, people that are um, conspiracy people. But we look around us and we see the church is sort of being targeted and silenced because the world wants us to be quiet. And so more than any time else, I believe the church should be stronger. The church shouldn't be silent, especially within its congregation. We should be building up one another, teaching one another, and preparing one another for ministry. Because I believe God has a mighty work that he wants to not only do in our lives, but he wants to do in every one of your lives. And so as the, as the Lord opens up opportunities for me to come and speak to the men at the ranch, that's one of the things that I encourage them. Because it isn't just about getting saved. It's about getting saved and allowing the Lord to do a work in our lives. He wants us to be active. He wants us to be about his business. And so today we're going to be looking at a portion of scripture that's in Ephesians. And it's in chapter 4. We're going to be looking at a portion of the Bible Uh, Chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Not a big portion, but it's a very strong portion. It's a reminder for all of us. First of all, it tells us who's actually doing the work, right? So many times you want to think that we are doing the work, right? In a sense, we are, but it's through Him. And so as I come to this church here, and as I see the work that God is doing, it's amazing, It's amazing to see the same faces, to see the same people, and to see what the Lord is doing in their lives. So before we get started, what I want to do is I want to read the portion of Scripture, but I also want to pray for some of the brothers who have been affected by this COVID, some of the sisters. I know uh, Pastor Johnny Reno is still going through a tough time, and our prayers are for him, and he's on a chain of prayers back at, in our ministries, in our churches Again, as uh, Pastor Thomas said, you know, I, I used to be involved with uh, the, uh, Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa for many years. I worked underneath Pastor Chuck. But it seems as though the Lord picked us up and moved us into another type of ministry, which is the Orange County Rescue Mission, where we get to still work and teach and share the gospel, the good news, to brothers and sisters who need it. Brothers and sisters who are growing up in the Lord. Because it's a place where a restoration is taking place where we serve the least, the last, and the lost. But again, it's another great ministry. And so what I want to do is read this portion of Scripture that we're going to be looking at this morning, and I want to pray, but also for those who've been affected. So if you have your Bibles out, please turn to chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 11 through 16. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. And this is how the church grows. But first and foremost, it grows as we, the congregation, become stronger. Scripture says here, Paul says here in verse 11, he says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, Till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man or woman, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro 
and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Verse 15, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that you've given us, Lord, just to be here today, this morning at church, as we worship you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would bless the worship leaders this morning as they led us to your feet, Lord. And Lord, it's a privilege to be able to sing out to you, Lord, because you are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of the glory for all that you've done in our lives. And Lord, we do lift up Pastor Jerry, who is out, who is up north. We ask, Lord, that you would give him traveling mercies. Lord, we pray that you would bring divine appointments to him, that there would be those that would hear him, hear his words, hear the message, and that their lives would be changed. We thank you for the work that is being done here at Calvary Chapel, Romoland. We thank you for the church that are the church doors that are open, allowing us to congregate and to meet and to fellowship. Koinonia, Lord, it's so important. And Lord, we pray for those churches who have not opened up their doors for whatever reason it might be. Lord, we ask that you would protect the churches as we're entering into a different season, a dark season. Lord, there's so many people out there that do not want to hear the gospel or hear the good news. And we pray that you would cause us to be more and more effective as we look at your scriptures, as we study your word, as you raise up more teachers, as you raise up more pastors to lead us and to guide us. Lord, that may we become strengthened. May we become those who stand in the gap as you use us, the church, the body, the members, And Lord, as we see your church grow, but Lord, we pray that you would also be with those who have been affected by this virus. We ask, Lord, that you would minister to their bodies. We ask that you would build up and strengthen. We pray that you would be with Pastor John in Reno as you continue to work on him, Lord, as you continue to strengthen him, Lord. We pray that you would bring him back to health, that he would be doing the things that he loves to do, and it's sharing your gospel. It's sharing... Your gospel through worship, Lord, we know that's his passion. And so, Lord, we pray that you would heal him quickly. We thank you for men who desire to teach the gospel, for this gentleman, Frank, who is going to go out and to share the gospel. Evangelism, Lord, it's so important. But it shouldn't just stop with him. It should start up with us as we have opportunities to share your love to a fallen world. So here we are, Lord, just thanking you for what you're going to do today, what you're going to teach us. And so open up our hearts, prepare our minds, Lord. Help us in those memory banks of ours, Lord. You know how we are, Lord. We can forget. We can become forgetful. And so, Lord, we pray that you would do a work within us this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So here we are looking at this. Uh, It's entitled... How the church grows. And again, as I said earlier, the church grows, but first we grow first. First, God is going to do a work within our lives, but then he's going to use us for ministry. And so here we see here, it says that God himself, God himself by his power builds us up, the congregation, but he also builds up the church. It says he himself gave some to be apostles prophets, evangelists, and, uh, and some pastors and teachers. So first of all, we see that it's God who appoints. It's God who builds up. It's God who brings into the, those positions. I know so many times we ourselves might believe and want to be in those positions. But we need to be careful. We need to make sure that it is God appointed. We know that Pastor Jerry raises up pastors for those to go out and leaders to go out and to be overseers. And I know he goes into prayer before he makes those decisions because we know that it's God himself who appoints these positions. It's God himself who has the power to create growth within our own lives, but growth within the churches. 
And as we look at these little positions here, not little, but as we look at these few positions that Paul talks about, he, he, first of all, he says apostles. And we know that the apostles in Jesus' times were those that were chosen, those that were witnesses of Jesus, whether it was, with his, whether it was his birth or his death or his ascension, they were witnesses of Jesus. They were the men that would uh, do signs and wonders. They would do the work of Jesus. They were sent out. There were 12 that were the foundation, the Bible says. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, it says that Jesus himself was that chief cornerstone. The chief cornerstone. The one that oversees all, everything, because it's been appointed to him by God. He goes on to say that there's prophets that the Lord gives. The Lord gave prophets in those days, and those were the ones, the men that spoke on behalf of God. And the prophets had a difficult job. Because every time the prophet spoke, there would be a situation, there would be a circumstance at the church or with the Israelites, right? Every time the prophets had to speak is because they were doing something they shouldn't be doing. So they had a tough job because nobody wants to hear correction. Nobody wants to hear that we're doing something wrong or what we should be doing, right? So every time the prophet spoke, they said, thus says the Lord. You know, whether it was to turn from sin, to turn from idolatry, or to turn to God himself. But they were those that would teach on prophecy, the things, the events that were going to take place. We know there, there was Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel that would be speaking into end times. He probably didn't know it then. But as we look at Scripture, we see how it's being fulfilled, how it's falling into place. And as we look at the Scriptures, we know that God's soon return is right around the corner, isn't it? Just by the things that are going on around us. But he says he gives evangelists, just like he's given Frank to us, to go out and to share the good news, to share the gospel. There are many great evangelists that have brought people to Christ. We, hear, we think of Billy Graham. We think of his son. We think of Pastor Greg Laurie, who go out there and utilize the gifts and talents that God has given them to share the good news. I know there are many people, I'm, I was reading about Pastor Chuck says he thought that was his gift or that was his calling, but he realized that it wasn't. There's many of us that desired those different types of gifts. But again, we make sure that God has called us to those things, that God has appointed us to these things. He finishes up in this little part with pastors and teachers. Pastors and teachers, they're sort of in the same group. We know that teachers are to teach us, to help us to grow, to understand the scriptures. But this word pastors, we get the Greek word episcopus. Epi meaning over and scopus meaning sight, where we get the word telescope. Because they're the ones that have been appointed to oversee the congregation. We have Pastor Jerry Brown, who is that episcopus, that one that has oversight over the church. Of course, there's sometimes a, 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 a group of men that make decisions and choices, but it's ultimately the responsibility of the pastor to oversee, to bring up, to care for the congregation. It would be a shepherd in those days to keep an eye on the sheep, to make sure they were healthy, to make sure that they needed to be bandaged if they were hurt. But the sheep had to be watched. It had to be careful because sometimes sheep can be sometimes careless, right? But just as Jesus was that good shepherd, the pastor is the good shepherd. And so it is God, he himself, who has appointed pastors, overseers over us that lead the congregation in its spiritual development. That's his job, to teach us, to show us. Of course, it's our job to study the Word of God, to get into the Word, to get into the Scriptures at every opportunity that we can. And when I do get the opportunity to speak to them, and I tell them that could be the most important thing that they can do is to be in the Word and to stay in the Word, as well as fellowship and prayer time. Because when you put these principles into place, there's nothing but growth that can take place, right? Right? Some of you understand that. I'm sure a lot of you do. The more you're in the Word, the stronger you become. So how does the church grow? How does the church grow or how do we grow? So, well, this morning we're going to discuss four things. 
four things I believe that the Word of God teaches us in this portion of Scripture that helps us to understand how we grow and how the church grows. The four things that we're going to look at is it grows by the ministry of the people. It grows by the motives of ministry. It grows by the maturity of its ministry. And it grows by the means of its relationship to Christ and the inner relationships of the members. Our inner relationship with Christ, but also our inner relationship with one another. I believe this is how the church grows. So first of all, it grows by the ministry of its members. It's ministry of its members. And we look at verse Uh, We look at verse 12. Let me read that to you again. It says, For the equipping, the equipping or the perfecting of the saints for the work of ministry. You see, there's one purpose that the pastor has for equipping or perfecting the saints, that's you and I, for the work of ministry, ultimately for the work of ministry. That's the reason why the pastor teaches us, why he brings us through the scriptures, because there's ministry to be done. Not just for the pastors, not just for the, the people working the soundboard, not the people that just set up the chairs, but the ministry is for all of us to be involved in. It's not a spectator sport, but in some way or another, we all need to be involved with ministry. So he says, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And when we look at this word perfecting, it speaks or It's a term that means to set a broken bone. You've probably heard that before. Perfecting, setting a broken bone, putting it back into the condition in which God has created it to be, right? Because we are are all created for one thing, for his purpose and his pleasure. Now, sometimes we make wrong choices, we make wrong decisions, and we go in a wrong way, right? And so the job of the church is to perfect, it's to equip, it's to bring us back into that complete state that God desires for each one of us. And that's why we're here today, because we want to be perfected. How many of you want to be perfected? How many of you want to be perfect? I certainly do, right? We might not reach perfection on this side of eternity, but still we are striving for perfection. And so that's what the church does. It equips the saints for the work of of the ministry, and that's why the ministry exists. And so what God means by this is he's putting us into a complete state. The ministry guides and directs us into a spiritual condition, right? That's acceptable to the Lord. And it, what it does, it prepares us for the work of ministry, for the divine things, for ministering to people, because God is going to bring opportunities in each and every one of our lives, whether we like it or not, He's going, to bring, bring, he's going to be bringing people into our lives that we are going to have the opportunity to minister to. Divine things, heavenly things. Not just sharing with them what we believe, what we believe, what we think, but what the Word of God says. And so that's what the church does. It equips. We are not just called to be saved, as I said earlier. I mean, it's great. When I came to the ranch here 23 years ago, Right? It was, it, it, I, I didn't know what was going on, but I know one thing, I knew I needed help. And when I got saved after a few weeks of listening to Pastor Jerry, I came to the conclusion that there was a change that needed to be done in my life. I was 34 years old at the time. I knew that I needed a change. So as I listened to him, wrote down notes, looked at the Word, prayed to the Lord, the Lord started to do that change in my life. But that wasn't the end of it. If I thought that was the end of it, I'd still be doing, you know, just going to church on Sunday and going on with my life. But it wasn't about just being called to salvation, to being saved, but it was a perfection that God wanted to develop in my life so that I would have an opportunity to share with others someday. And that's what he wants for each and every one of us. The the game is not over. I don't want to call it a game, but it's not over when we become saved. When we say, Lord Jesus Christ, come into my life, save me, forgive me my sins, work in me. And that's not where it ends. That's when he starts working in you, perfecting you for that work of ministry so that we may be able to serve in ministry to serve others 
in those divine matters. That's what God wants to do in each and every one of our lives. And we know that there's a whole world that will someday soon require conversion, right? And we just may be the ones that have the opportunity to bring them to that. Some of you, I believe almost most of you know somebody who doesn't know the Lord, right? Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a child that you have. Maybe it's a relative. But still, they need Jesus, and God wants to work in our lives to help share it with them. So first, the church works in us in equipping us, and also through the exercising of spiritual gifts. The exercising of spiritual gifts. The gifts that God has given us, we need to put them into action, right? When we learn how to do something, whether it was, you know, when we learn, for some of us, when we learn how to play a sport or ride a skateboard or ride a bicycle, if we didn't do it constantly, we wouldn't be good at it, right? Well, just like the scriptures, the Bible, if we want to become good at it, we need to exercise what the Lord has given us. And let me read to you, if you, if you have your Bibles, please look over at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Oh, no, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm sorry. And we're going to be looking at a few verses right there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. Exercising the spiritual gifts. Here we see Paul is going to be speaking of nine different gifts that the Lord has given to us, to the congregation, to the church, to the body, and we are to exercise those gifts. It says here in verse 4, it says, There are diversity of gifts, but the same Spirit. Verse 5, There are differences of ministry, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works in all. So the first thing that we see that's clear is that it is the Spirit, the Son, and it's the Father. Just as we read in uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, it is God who gives some. We see here that it is the Holy Spirit that it says that there are diversity of gifts, but that it's the same Spirit. It's the same Spirit that gives these gifts. Because so many times some of us have a gift, different gifts, right? But just because we have a certain gift that somebody else doesn't have and they have one that we don't have, doesn't mean that ours are any better because it's given by the same Spirit. It's given by the same God. It's given by Christ himself. As we look at here, we see there's going to be a subtle, very subtle work of the Trinity, right? You saw that. The Spirit, the same Lord, Jesus, and it's the same God who works in all. You see, it's God again who works all these different gifts within our lives. And as we look at these gifts, you know, I mean, we're not going to look at the, each gift but we're going to say, you know, the, there's the word of knowledge. There's the, the word of wisdom, um, prophecy, discerning spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. But all of these gifts that the Lord desires to give us, because what it's going to cause, it's going to cause growth within the body. It's going to be, become growth within the church, but it's the same spirit. And we know there are other places in the Bible where Paul talks about the gifts of the Spirit, right? The gifts of the Spirit, and he goes through nine different characteristics. But they are all of the Spirit, which means that it's the Spirit that is working in our lives as we're studying His Word. He's the one that cultivates the ground. Sometimes it's harder ground. I know the ground that He had to work on in my life was very tough, right? Because I had a long life, long life of drugs and incarceration and homelessness. So my ground was very hard to work on, but I know that it was the Holy Spirit. He's the one that cultivated it. He's the one that planted things there, good things. And he's the one that caused the fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, right? Long-suffering, kindness, goodness, right? All those characteristics are the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. And that's why I continue on saying how important it is for us to be in God's Word. God's Word is the most important thing that we can attach ourselves to. That's how the church grows. And we exercise those gifts. But the gifts are distributed by the, the Spirit, it says. There are different ministries. And we know that from the beginning of our study here. God gives to some, you know, prophets, apostles, 
There are different ministries. There are different ministries here in Calvary Chapel, Romoland, right? And some of us are overseeing those different ministries. We have the helps ministry. We have a coffee ministry. We have the soundboard ministry. We have the ministry where somebody comes in and takes care of the, the chairs and makes sure everything's vacuumed and ready to go, right? There are difference in ministries. There are diverse activities, it says here in verse 6. And there are diversities and activities, but it is the same God who works in all. This word activities is where we get the word energy or energize or energetic because it's the work of the Holy Spirit that is moving in the church. It's a word that means active, miraculous power. And you know that can only be the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, there are times when we have an opportunity to share with somebody and we really don't know what to say sometimes. You know, how do we, you know, what, what do we do with this situation? But at the end of the conversation, they're just like, yeah, you know, I, I want to know Jesus. Who is he? And you're able to maybe lead them through the prayer. And they come to, and you're wondering, how did this even happen? Maybe you were, maybe you were telling somebody about prophecy. Maybe you're telling somebody about something that was just completely different. But it was just the work of the Holy Spirit that communicated to them that message that they needed to hear that brought them to the point of just, I want Jesus, right? That's what the work of the Holy Spirit is. There's diversity. There's different activities that the Holy Spirit does in the body. So the gifts are diverse, ministries are different, and the activities are diverse. But it is the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the same Lord, the same Jesus Lord, and the same Father God doing the work through the gifts, the ministries, and the activities. So here we see the Trinity at work. Trinity is at work here. But ultimately, it's for all. In verse 7 it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Again, we see here how the church grows because it's working in all of us individually, but it's working in us all corporately is what it says in verse 7. Verse 11 of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians says, But one and the same Spirit works in all of these things, distributing, distributing to each one individually as He wills. So here we see that it is still the Lord that is accomplishing all that work. So we see that it equips. First it equips. It exercises. And now we're going to look at the motives. It grows by the motives of the members. Motives. And we see that in verse 13. Paul says in verse 13 of Ephesians chapter 4, he says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I love that. It grows by the motives of the members, and it's based on Christian unity, and it's based on Christian maturity. Unity and maturity. Per perfect unity will not occur until we all believe and know and therefore act like Jesus Christ, right? That's perfection. And again, I'll be the first one to raise my hand, and my wife Kathy will, uh, you know, <laughs> will tell you that I, have I haven't reached perfection. I'm not perfect. But we continue to move to that direction, and that's why Pastor Jerry Brown is here Sunday after Sunday, uh, you know, going over the same territory week after week, because we have not reached that perfect unity. That's the job of the minister. That's the job of the church. It's to bring us to that point where we come to the unity of the faith. Not just an, uh, a faith. It says the faith. Because there's only one belief in Jesus Christ. There's only one gospel message. Right? It's not the, to the unity of faith. But to the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. And we have not come to that yet. We have not become that perfect man. As Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, if you like, you can turn there. He says, Not that I have already attained, or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Even Paul admits he hasn't attained. 
He hasn't come to that perfection. But one thing that we should do is we should continue on moving and pressing towards that, right? It's like that race that Paul says that we're in. We're moving. We're running. It's an active activity, in a sense. It's energy. We're moving towards that point in our life, even though we not, might not reach, well, we won't reach perfection on this side of eternity, but we're going to be moving towards that. We're going to be looking to come to the perfect man. And also, we have not come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And again, that's why the ministry continues to preach. It's the job of the ministry. And even sometimes, the preaching can, can, can become a little bit trite, right? Kind of repetitive at times. It can become boring, but that is the ministry's job. I know sometimes, you know, as when I was a new believer, you know, you want to go to different churches. You want to hear different pastors and teachers. And you'd go there and you'd listen and you, and you, the beginning of the message would, would, would start and you would think to, I would think to myself, hey, I've heard that message before or I, I've heard that portion of the Bible before, Right? How many times have we gone through the Bible? How many of us have read the Bible and read it again and again? It's the same book. It's the same book that changes our life. It's almost the same messages at times that we hear, right? I'm sure many of you have heard a message on this passage about equipping the church and how it grows, right? But since we haven't reached that perfection, the Lord allows us to continue on hearing it and listening to it week after week until we reach that perfect, or until that perfect man is produced in ourselves, or perfect woman, right? We are always striving for that, but we're never going to reach that. And so that's what the job of the ministry is. And sometimes it becomes a little bit repetitive. Well, I've heard that already. You know, I just heard that last week, or I heard that a couple weeks ago. But the Lord says, wait a second. We will continue to hear the messages that ministers, that pastors have prepared for us in order to build us up and to strengthen us. And until we've come to that perfect body, we're going to continue on hearing it. But it's also hope that a minister or a pastor can come to that message or come at that message in a different angle, right? To to make it more alive, to make it, you know, to, to provide a deeper understanding, and we see that when we hear the messages. The pastors become a little bit more acquainted with the scriptures. They give us a little bit deeper of an understanding. They explain things in a better way. And that's what is hoped of the pastor or the church. They want to make it fresh and interesting so that we are able to digest it, to eat it. But again, it's God who gave the ministry this gold. It's he that desires for us to attain it. And so the ministry, if it's going to be faithful, it's going to continue on preaching the word of God. And again, as I said earlier at the beginning, there's so many churches that are going in different directions. They don't want to seem, you know, maybe attaching themselves to different agendas, maybe the world's agenda. And they're teaching a different ministry, or they're teaching a different word, or they're teaching something differently. But we know if the church, if the ministry is going to be faithful, they're going to teach us the Word of God, the pure and unadulterated Word of God, because it's in everybody's best interest that the, that the ministry does that. We all want to be in God's kingdom one day, right? Okay, so now let's look at it. it grows by the maturity of its members. It grows by the maturity of its members. This is, a, this is difficult at times. One of the things we want to make sure that we're doing is we're maturing. We're growing up. Verse 14 and 15, let me read that to you. It says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, that we should no longer become children being tossed to and fro. And that's one of the the dangers of ministry. We want to make sure that we are teaching the Word of God in a way that's going to build up maturity 
in the congregation because that's how the church grows. And so the first thing we notice here are the problems to be faced. The problems to be faced because I, as I said, there are some churches that aren't preaching everything that needs to be preached. They are looking to those uh, passages in the Bible that are sort of fluffy and make us feel good. And so that when we leave that church that day, there's no real conviction in our heart. Or there's no real challenge in what God wants to do in our lives. But we certainly don't want to make those problems. Immaturity is one of the things that can be faced in the church. One of the uh, problems that, 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 that is faced in the church. And it's immaturity in our understanding. Let me read to you a portion of Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. 12. Hebrews chapter 5. This is the writer of Hebrews. Some people aren't sure who it is. I think it might be Paul, Barnabas. But verse 11 of chapter 5 in Hebrews says, Of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracle of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. Verse 13, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So here Paul is saying, hey, you know, by this time, and I I have to admit, you know, five years, ten years into being a believer, a Christian, and working in ministry, there were certain things that I hadn't really looked at. You know, I was so involved with maybe helps ministry, you know, getting everything set up, working at the conferences, that I had neglected studying certain portions of the Bible that would really mature me and to place me in that position of being maybe a teacher, maybe an overseer. And I know one thing about Pastor Jerry, he likes to challenge the men that are on this ranch and some of the men who have gone through the ranch, the overseers, and that's why he will call upon us at times and ask us to teach, to do a devotions. When we go out and do our retreats and stuff, he will choose somebody. He might choose you just off the wall. It might be like, hey, tomorrow morning or in an hour, I need you to do this, right? (laughs) We're challenged at times, right? But sometimes... You know, just as Paul is saying here, there's immaturity sometimes. After 10 years, we should be those that are teaching, those that are sharing the gospel in ways that can be effective. And sometimes we struggle with that because, you know, for one thing, we don't feel as though we are um, uh, uh, able to, or we don't feel that that's our calling. But in a sense, it's all of our calling. We should be those that desire to teach. We shouldn't be those that are still babies. You know, sometimes I, I heard a guy tell me one time, he goes, you can either be a baby or a babysitter. Which one do you want to be? You want to be a baby or a babysitter? And I was like, well, what does that mean? He goes, either you can have somebody, you know, giving you the milk or, you know, or feeding you, or you can be one that feeds others. You can be one that builds up others. You can be one that strengthens others. Or do you want somebody who's taking care of you all the time? And I said, well, I, I, want to be, I don't want to be a baby. I want to be a babysitter. You know what I mean? I want to be one that oversees, one that takes care of, one that helps and nourishes and builds up. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being a baby, right? Some of us have babies. Some of us have grandchildren. I have two grandchildren and one on its way. And there's nothing cuter than that little baby learning how to say grandma or grandpa, right? Because those are the words we want them to say first before mom and dad. <laughs> Right? We want them to say grandpa. I want them to say grandpa. So when they come up to you and they're like, goo goo, gaga, you know, and you're, you're sort of, you know, oh, I think he said it. You know, I think he said it. And, you, and you're kind of like, and you record it and everything, you show everybody, right? You're proud of it. But that little grandchild, in 10 years or 12 years, as it's getting older, and he comes up to me and he says that same thing, like goo goo, gaga, I'm going to say, whoa, something's wrong. Right? There's immaturity. There's no growth. He said, you know, it's cute when he's at the age of one and two, but when he's 12 years old and he's still saying Gugu Gaga, there's a problem there. And that's what Paul is saying in Hebrews, or the writer of Hebrews. He's saying, by now we should be teachers. By now we should be understanding the Word of God that we can share it with others and share it in an effective way. 
And that's the job of the ministry. The job of the ministry, when we're sitting, when we're sitting in, in, in the pews and we're sitting in the chairs listening to the pastor, that's why he's teaching us. So that way we can come to that perfect man. So that we can come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son. You know, the stature of the fullness of Christ. But also so that we would not be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Because there's a lot of false doctrine going on. And we know that to be true because that's what the Bible said would come. In the end days, there are going to be some false teachers. There's going to be some false doctrine. There's going to be some false things that are going to be said. And if we aren't able to discern what it is, right, we might be tricked. We could be deceived. Is that real? Is it not real? I don't know. Well, he said it from up there. Maybe it is real, right? But we need to be those that check the Word of God, that check and read the Scriptures so that we are able to discern whether what the pastor is saying or the teacher is correct. So first we see the, the problem is immaturity. But we see the instability. He uses that, you know, that uh, illustration of the wind carried about with every wind of doctrine, you know. And it seems like there are different seasons of times when there's a different thing being taught and everybody's attracted to it. And then there's another wind of doctrine that passes through the church and everybody starts to gravitate towards that. Again, being immature and untrained, you're liable to move in those directions. But again, in the inability to discern motives and deceitful practices. We have to handle the true currency, the true, so that we understand what false is. So we know what the fake is, right? So it says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. The trickery of men. There are men out there, there are people out there that want to deceive us, not just accidentally deceiving us, but they want to deceive you. And when we, when we look at everything that's been going on around us, we know that there's been a lot of deception. We know that there's a lot of things that haven't been mentioned, things that we haven't been told, the things that are going around us. And I don't want to get into the political things, but there's a lot of things that are happening that they're not allowing us to be aware of. We don't want to be those that are tossed to and fro. We don't want to be <laughs> tricked by men. That word trickery of men is that picture that you see, uh, you know, have you heard of loaded dice? You know, they're going to, every time they roll the dice, they're going, to, they're going to roll in a way that benefits them. And that's why they are, that's why the, the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, and they're good at it. They've been practicing it. They've been going over it. And so that if we are not aware, if we are not mature, if we are unstable, and if we don't have the inability to understand what it is, we're going to be tricked by them. We're going to be deceived by them because that's what they want to do. The trickery, the loaded dice, they're playing recklessly with people's lives. But we see the beginning of verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, and that's the prerequisite. That's what comes first. If we understand the Word of God, preaching the, speaking the truth in love, it's the truth that's going, to, that's going to help us to understand what false is. But we do it in love. And especially as we're building, as we're desiring to build unity within the church. Right? He says that there's unity that is going to be, till we all come to the unity of faith. As we teach the Word of God in love, even as we teach it, and as we speak it to those who are desiring to deceive us, to trick us. That we don't come at them with a Bible and we you know, chase them around and try to get them out. But know that we, that we speak the truth in love. That we are able to hold on to the truth and follow the truth at all costs. Right? We don't want to diminish what the Word of God says. We don't want to be afraid or say, well, maybe if I tell them the truth, they're not going to come. If I tell them the truth, it's going to turn them off. You know, maybe we sort of, uh, you know, sugarcoat the truth. But here, Paul says that we should speak the truth in love. And what he means is that we should be holding to the truth at all costs and following the truth. It'll keep us from being children that are described in, that, in verse 14. 
tossed to and fro. So it grows by the ministry of its people. It grows by the motives of the ministry. It grows by the maturity of ministry. And now it grows by the means of the relationships with Christ and our inner relationships of the members. First and foremost, our relationship with Christ is how the church grows. and It's how we grow. But what Paul is going to explain here is it grows by our inner relationships with one another. That's what's going to build unity. But again, he's going to work in each of us individually, but he works in us corporately. He's going to work in our lives, but we need one another. And that's why it's so important that we continue to remain, the churches remain, uh, have their, church, their doors to remain open. As I was saying earlier, there's so many churches that have closed their doors that they're worried about this. And, and I don't say that we open up the doors irresponsibly, that we just do what, you know, uh, go against what, you know, uh, what, what some of the concerns are. That, you know, it, it's, a, it's a virus. There's something going on. We should be careful. We should open up with, you know, with, uh, with certain direction. But we should have the doors open. We should re- remain the doors open because this, this body of Christ ourselves, the church, grows as our inner relationships are strengthened with one another. And let's read this. Let's start with 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Verse 16. From whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working, by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Inner relationships. So, looking back, we know that the ministry does this. In verse 14, it says that we are no longer going to be babes. We're no longer going to be children that are going to be tossed around with every wind of doctrine. That we're not going to be children that are going to be tricked and deceived but he starts here by saying that as we speak the truth in love this is going to cause ministry moving us from those spiritual babes into taking on the character of christ it's not that we are coming into him or turning into him but we're coming closer to him when it says we grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. He is the head because all things have been given to him. Let me look, let me turn back a page in Ephesians 122. In Ephesians 122, let me read that really quick. It says, And he put all things under his feet. We're talking about God putting all things under the feet of Jesus. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things things to the church. That's, that's, that, that's Jesus, right? And so as we continue to grow into him, as we continue to press into Christ, into God, and the only way to do that is through the word of God, right? We just don't just, you know, press into him and doing our own thing, right? Some of us have, you know, maybe some of us haven't really been pressing into the word. Maybe some of us have been distracted by things, I get it. It's busy, right? We have full-time jobs. We have families. We have things going on. We have commitments. We have responsibilities. We have, we, you know, we have chores, right? It's difficult at times, yeah, you know? But it says that, you know, the best way to, to, to move or to move into him, which is the head, Christ, which is the overseer of the church, is to stay in the word. And so here it says that, as we continue to move into him, speaking the word and truth and love, it causes that maturity. We start taking on the character of Christ, of God. We become more incorporated with him. And we start to figure out that it's more, it's easier, it's harder to be tricked as we understand what the truth is. As we start understanding what the word of God says, and that only comes from opening up the scriptures from understanding the scriptures, from reading the scriptures. And pretty soon we start being those men and women that aren't easily deceived. I know for myself, there's many times when I was deceived. You know, sometimes we've moved into relationships that aren't good. Friendships, maybe business partners. How many of us have ever done something that isn't, wasn't too good? There wasn't a good outcome, right? 
So here what it's saying is that we are together growing in the church. We're going to start, be, we're going to start making wiser decisions. So when we speak the truth, we expose error, right? When we speak the truth, we, we expose error. And it's like shining a light in a dark place. We know that the Word of God is often compared to the light. In Psalms 119, verse 105, I know there's a song. It says, Thy word is a lamp, is a light unto my feet, and a lamp, a lamp unto my path, right? The more the light is turned on, the less of a chance that we have of stumbling, right? When we can see something, if you've ever moved around in a dark place, you have a better chance of stubbing your toe, right? Of hitting your knee on, on a table or something. But when that light is turned on, when we speak the truth, the light is turned on, we expose error, but it keeps us from stumbling. It keeps us from getting tripped up. It keeps us from falling into the things that God has taken us out of. Because so often that happens in ministry. We, we get saved, we, we have a good walk with the Lord, and next thing you know, we sort of stop pressing into the Word of God, stop pressing into Him, as it says here, and we fall back to our old nature. We know that the truth, it calms and it settles. It guides and directs. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures from Psalm 19. Psalms 19. And it is a worthwhile study. If you ever want to do a study to just to become a little bit more grounded to, the, uh, to uh, God's effective work in our lives, I'm going to read to you three scriptures from Psalms 19. It's towards the middle. Psalms 19, verses 7 through 10, or 7 through 9. Three scriptures. This is what the Word of God does. This is how it keeps us and it directs us and it strengthens us. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. First of all, let's get that straight. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. That's where we get conversion. That's where we get that change in our lives. But the soul, that's the inner being of ourselves. It's not a surface thing. It's not just a change of how we look, but it's a change of our heart. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. Again, our choices and decisions become a little bit better. Verse 8, the statutes, of, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Are we feeling down? Are we upset about something? This is rejoicing of the heart because the Lord, the statutes of the Lord are right. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Are there times when we feel as though we're walking around blind, not understanding? It says it enlightens the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So here we just see in a few verses what the scriptures can do. How it enlightens, how it purifies us, how it keeps us from stumbling, how it gives us direction. When we turn on the light, darkness is dispelled, and so the truth is exposed, right? It calms us. But let's look at verse 16. Notice in verse 16, Paul does not say by what every part or member supplies, because we are all members of, of the body of Christ, right? We're all a part of the ministry. We are all members. But he doesn't say by what every part or member supplies. He says from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. By what every joint supplies. And that's when we, this is where we're going to be looking at our inner relationships with one another. And the best way that I can explain it, I don't know, some of you might have a table or a chair at home that looks nice, right? But you never let anybody sit in it because there's maybe a wobbly leg on it. Or maybe the table sort of moves around when you're using it, when you're eating your dinner or eating your lunch at the table, right? You've seen those tables, huh? How many of us have seen those tables that are sort of wobbly? They look good and everything, right? But they're wobbly. And if you really look at the table, there's nothing wrong with the legs. Look at the chair, there's nothing wrong with the legs. And you look at the seat, there's nothing wrong with the seat or even the backing on it. But if you look closely at that chair, you realize that some of the bolts are loose, especially if it's Ikea or something, right? 
Some of the bolts are loose, and it causes that chair to be a little bit rickety. That table is a little bit wobbly, and so that table or that chair is ineffective, right? It isn't, it isn't I mean, you can still use it, but it, you can't use it to the extent that it can be used. And that's sort of like the ministry, because it doesn't say each part or member or each leg or chair, but it says each joint. That joint is our relationship with one another, how we communicate with one another. Are we speaking the truth in love with one another? Are we being patient with one another? Are we congregating and meeting with one another, right? That's how the church grows. Our inner relationships, first and foremost to Christ, Christ is the one that we should be seeking, we should be learning about and understanding who he is. And when we do that, we realize that our lives become a little bit more manageable. But as we come to the church, you know, it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, is that we should not forsake the assembly of God. And going all the way back to the beginning where I said that there's, that the churches are in the crosshairs of this country. They're wanting to silence a lot of the churches. They're wanting to close down a lot of the churches, especially those that are being a little bit outspoken. Yes, there are some that are really outspoken, right? But ultimately, they realize that what brings us together as believers, as Christians, is the church. That's what builds up the strength. That's what builds up the unity. That's what builds up our faith. That's what makes the church stronger and stronger so that we can Teach the truth. Expose the error, the deceivement, right? And that's the job of the church. It opens up, but this is how it does it. It grows by the means of the relationship to Christ and the inner relationships of the members. It makes us more unified because ultimately that's what the church was saying that it needed to do to equip the saints for the work of the ministry till we all come to the unity of of the faith, not just a faith, but the faith in Christ Jesus. And the church becomes more effective when the unity within the body, within the individuals, our relationships are strengthened. Because then the church becomes stronger. The church becomes more effective. We're able to reach more people, our communities. We're able to reach our own families, our loved ones, and we're able to bring them to Christ, because ultimately it's his work, right? It is God who gave some to be, and he gives the different types of ministries. It's the Holy Spirit that cultivates and works within our lives, you know, the, the, the work, what is it, the, the works of, but the gifts of the Spirit are, right? They're, they're his gifts, they're his works, it's his job that works within our lives, that we can, but we need to continue on seeking him and seeing who he is. So even though there could be nothing wrong with a church, it could still be a little bit feeble, a little bit wobbly, because we haven't learned to come together as believers, as Christians, growing. And that's part of the ministry. And that's why they have a lot of things like the, the Mexico trip, right? They have the Valentine's saying, sometimes they have a, a singles ministry, sometimes they have a marriage class. Because what that does is it continues to build union within the church. So a couple of the things we need to look at. We need to rely completely on Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. We need to completely rely on Jesus Christ as being the head. We need to recognize the importance and the need for one another. That's how the ministry grows. We need to realize how important each and every one of us is because we are the body. We are the church. We need to realize that God's works and every mem that God works in every member to affect the other members. Again, the work is not not necessarily for ourselves, but is for those who are sitting next to us, those who are coming to church. And we need to remember that true spiritual growth occurs in the sphere or in the circle of God's love. That's when it's the most effective, when we share it, when we speak it in truth, and we speak it in love. And then we just look to see what God is going to do. And it's exciting to see the work that God is doing here in the church and what he's doing in the different ranches, the U-Turn for Christ, the women's and the men's ranches, not just in here, United States, but we have them around the world. And again, it's for the edifying of itself and love. 
In closing, this is what he says. He says, according to the effect of working, by what every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Growth for the body for the edifying of itself in love. That's how the church grows. There's growth only in the spiritually alive, not in the dead. If you see those churches that are not moving, they're sort of lethargic. There's not much going on. You have to ask yourself, what are they teaching? What is the ministry doing there? Again, we know that so much of the world would like to see the churches just disappear. But we know that God wants to continue on doing a work in our lives, and He's going to do that as we continue to lean upon Him, as we continue to study His Word, as we continue to look to Him in the Scriptures. It's the most important thing we can do to apply those three principles, fellowship, Word of God, and prayer. Those are the key components. We put those into place, guess what? There's going to be a work that's going to be done here in the church. We're going to be effective, right? But but we can't affect anybody unless we become infected, in a sense. (laughs) Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for for your grace, your love, your mercy. We thank you for the work that you do in ministries, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to teach us, that you would continue to show us, that you would continue to direct us, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you would be with this church and the members here, Lord. I pray that you would work in their hearts and in their lives. I pray that you would teach them, that you would speak to them. As they read your scriptures, that you would, that you would illuminate those scriptures, that you would bring to them revelation, and that each and every time they open up your word, it would be exciting, Lord, that they would learn something new. And Lord, I pray that you would be with the ministry here. I pray, Lord, that they would continue to have their doors open, allowing the people to gather, that our relationships with one another would become stronger and that they would grow more unified and that they would grow into you, into maturity, into that perfect man or that perfect woman that you desire to be, Lord. So help us not to be immature. Help us not to be ineffective but help us to be more effective. Lord, I know there's some of us here this morning that don't know who you are completely, that don't understand you, why you came to earth, what you desire to do in our lives, Lord. I pray that you would be with them, with those men and women, and I pray that you would give them a special, just a special time with you, Lord. I pray that you would speak to them in a way that they can hear and understand who you are, what you desire to do in their lives what you desire to do through their lives, Lord. We all are a part of ministry. And so, Lord, we ask that you would continue to use us for your work. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.